Hi, and welcome again to this series of videos on structural dynamics. In previous videos, we discussed the different types of sources of uh, dynamic excitations and problems that can arise. This video is dedicated to design and remedial measures. So as we know and we have seen before, the excitation of a system can be described in the frequency or in the time domain. Then a model can be built resulting mostly in M, C and K matrices and the computation of modal properties. And based on this, we can compute a response in the frequency or in the time domain. Now, the question is, is this response acceptable depending on the application and if yes of course there is no problem but if no you have to redo the design or um, apply some remedial measures it is important to uh, i think distinguish in these de design and remedial measures if the type of excitation and response is more narrow band or broadband so what i will uh, mean here by narrow band is that it is uh, mostly exciting one, a single resonance of the structure. So examples are earthquakes, which most of the time will only excite the first uh, mode of the structure. Machines, which run at a certain frequency. Pedestrians, uh, which as we have seen have a main excitation around 2 Hz. Vortex induced vibrations uh, and instabilities like galloping and flutter. Different solutions to these problems can be applied, which will be detailed later. So high or low tuning, damping using a tuned absorber, isolation and reshaping. Now, if the problem is more broadband and there are multiple resonances concerned, like in the case of turbulent wind or shocks or traffic induced vibrations, you will be able to use mostly high tuning damping but with material damping, isolation and reshaping. Most of the design and remedial measures consist in trying to stay away from resonance or trying to decrease the amplification at resonance. The first design and remedial measure we're going to discuss is high and low tuning. So low tuning uh, consists in tuning the frequencies of your structure, so the resonant frequency, so that it is lower than the forcing frequencies. Whereas high tuning consists in tuning your structure so that the resonant frequency is higher than the forcing frequencies. Of course the goal is always to avoid that the forcing frequencies match the resonant frequency and induce large vibration amplitudes. Now from this graph it uh, would seem clear that it's better to use low tuning because you see that here the response at low tuning is lower than the response here at high tuning when you, where you have some amplification due to the resonance. But if you look at a, a system which has several frequencies then in this case you will see that of course the risk of low, low tuning is that by putting the first resonance frequency lower the, than the forcing frequency you might have other natural frequencies if there are multiple resonances that match the forcing frequency. So you would have to put all the natural frequencies below the forcing frequency which might prove uh, impossible. In the case of high tuning however you see that if you have other natural frequencies higher than this one, as the forcing frequencies are lower than the first one, you will be safe with all the mode shapes which are um, present here in the structure. Now high tuning will uh, usually be performed by stiffening your structure, but in the case that you cannot stiffen it enough to get out of the band of all the forcing frequencies, this diagram shows you that you will still decrease the resonance of your system by 
stiffening. Using high or low tuning to stay away from resonance is not always possible. So in the case you cannot avoid the matching of the forcing frequencies with the resonance uh, of the structure, another possibility is to add damping. Obviously another way to reduce the amplitude at the resonance is to add damping. So as we see here, if you are multiplying the damping by 10, the amplitude at resonance will be divided by 10. So another mean of adding a damping to a structure is to use a tuned mass damper as demonstrated in this video. A tuned mass damper or a TMD is a simple passive device that can eliminate undesirable motion due to resonant vibration within a mechanical structure. Typically the TMD is attached to a point on the structure where the vibration induced displacements are the largest. In this case we have attached the TMD to the end of the cantilevered aluminum beam. To observe the undamped response of the beam, the action of the TMD is negated by the use of a small rubber block or stopper. This effectively turns the TMD off. When the rubber stopper is removed, the TMD is allowed to function. When the aluminum beam is struck by the hammer with the TMD turned off, the excitation of the beam's first bending mode and the resulting vibration can easily be observed dying out very slowly. With the TMD activated, the vibration is highly damped and the motion dies out in two to three cycles. Tude vibration absorbers essentially dissipate the energy in the system. Another design and remedial measure consists in preventing the vibration source from reaching the object as much as possible. This is called vibration isolation. So another solution against vibration is vibration isolation, which consists more into isolating objects from the vibration source, as demonstrated in this video. TMC the world leader in high performance vibration isolation systems features this wine glass demo at many trade shows. It demonstrates how effectively our passive vibration isolation tables isolate low frequency floor vibration. We place our 63500 series lab table on a deck which in turn is driven by a mechanical shaker system which inputs extremely high amplitude vibration to the table. By placing one glass of wine on a non-isolated shelf and another on the isolated tabletop, we are able to demonstrate just how dramatically our products attenuate vibration. So using vibration isolation will prevent as much as possible the vibration to reach uh, the object. Another possibility would be to reshape the object so that the force acting on it changes. A typical example is for wind excitation. The idea of reshaping is to change the shape of an object to decrease the amount of dynamic forces that act on it, as will be detailed in this video. Wind is one of the most important factors that architects and engineers must consider when designing tall buildings. While skyscrapers might appear to be highly strengthened immovable structures, all tall buildings are in fact designed with a degree of flexibility in mind. This is principally due to the impact that wind forces, known as wind loads, have on a building as it becomes taller. Whilst you might be experiencing a pleasant breeze at street level, the force of the wind generally grows much stronger the higher up you travel. While the steel and concrete used in a skyscraper's superstructure is designed to bend and flex to absorb the impact that these wind loads have, the degree to which a structure is able to move can have a significant impact on the comfort of those inside the building. When buildings first began to grow tall in the 1890s and 1900s, height limits were imposed, such as those introduced in Chicago, to prevent their masses from blocking sunlight. In New York City, ordinances were passed that allowed tall buildings to develop on the basis that they were set back after reaching a certain height. 
This allows sunlight to reach street level, whilst breaking up the facade and reducing the impact that high winds had on these early towers. By the 1960s, however, larger, box-like skyscrapers began to come to prevalence, bringing with them a whole host of wind load engineering challenges. The first problem that began to arise was increased wind velocity at street level. This was principally caused by the street canyon phenomenon, an effect that sees large buildings redirect wind down their facades, which effectively act like canyon walls, and funnel it along streets at much higher velocities than in low-rise suburban areas. The street canyon effect was particularly notable in Manhattan, where the heavily formalized grid structure of the city blocks offered little to break up and deflect winds once they began to blow. Additionally, as wind moved around the top of these tall structures, vortices were being created in a process known as vortex shedding. This process, much like water flowing down a stream, acts differently on obstacles depending on how streamlined they are. In the case of these buildings, their sheer block walls created a bluff obstacle that wind had to flow around. As strong winds moved around these structures, areas of low pressure emerged on the opposite side of them, creating suction forces that pulled at the buildings, causing them to sway back and forth. While any such movement may initially be minimal, high winds can create vortices that can match the frequency of the building they are moving around, causing noticeable swaying and shaking motions for those inside. This phenomenon led engineers to begin testing models of tall buildings in wind tunnels at design stage, assessing the potential impact of high winds on structures before they were constructed. By doing this, project teams were able to develop innovative approaches to managing wind loads, reducing their impact on tall buildings and enabling them to rise even higher. The first and by far simplest way to reduce the impact of high winds on a tall building is with an approach called corner softening. Corner softening sees sharp edges smoothed off of a structure to make it more aerodynamic, or small cutouts created on the edges of a structure to scramble prevailing winds and reduce the strength of the vortices they create. A prominent example is the ornamental design of Taiwan's Taipei 101, where relatively minor cutouts on the building's corners reduced movement by as much as 25%. Tapering a building as it rises also breaks up the uniformity that causes vortex shedding. Kuala Lumpur's Petronas Towers and The Shard in London both use this technique to reduce the effect that high winds have on their structures. Taking things a step further, alternating a building's profile as it rises and including setbacks, can also reduce the strength of vortices as they move around buildings. Some of New York City's early skyscrapers achieved this in response to the setback ordinances of 1916. But perhaps the most notable example today is the 828-metre Burj Khalifa in the United Arab Emirates, the world's tallest building at the time of filming. This remarkable structure uses a range of techniques to tame the wind and achieve its height, including an extreme taper, multiple setbacks, and a high degree of corner softening. We've demonstrated how the Burj Khalifa's carefully crafted design manages the wind in this simulation, developed using SimScale's software. With more than 150,000 users worldwide, SimScale is an easy-to-use cloud-based engineering simulation platform it enables everyone to create powerful, high-fidelity simulations in a web browser. The platform can be tried for free through the community account, which gives access to thousands of public simulations to promote knowledge sharing and to crowdsource advice. Creating a twist in a building's form can also reduce the impact of vortex shedding. With every floor offset to the last, the number of bluff areas across these structures is considerably reduced, minimizing, or in some cases completely eliminating, the locations where vortices can form. Perhaps the most breathtaking example of this technique 
can be seen in China's mega-tall Shanghai Tower, which tames the wind and rises to become the world's second tallest building by elegantly twisting throughout its 632-metre height. Another way to reduce the impact of high winds on tall buildings is to increase their porosity, cutting out parts of the structure and allowing air to flow through as well as around the building mass. This technique has been used in a number of high-profile skyscrapers around the world, including Saudi Arabia's Kingdom Center and the World Finance Center in Shanghai, China. But the most impressive example can be seen in New York City's 432 Park Avenue. With an incredible width-to-height ratio of 1 to 15, the tower is one of the world's most slender skyscrapers and the most prominent manifestation of New York's emerging super-skinny residential tower trend to date. The 426-metre tower features double-floor cutouts at 12-storey intervals throughout its height, allowing wind to pass through as well as around its extremely thin structure. We have again demonstrated the impact of this approach in a SimScale simulation. Some buildings using this approach have tried to incorporate wind turbines into their voids in an effort to harness wind energy and convert it to electricity. Despite the obvious benefits of this, wind turbines on skyscrapers never really seem to have caught on. This video was aimed at giving you an overview of the possible design and remedial measures when vibration problems are encountered in engineering. Some of these design and remedial measures are more detailed in separate videos.